Hi, everybody, and welcome back. This is Professor Hall, and this is our third lecture about Rebecca. Um, particularly looking at themes. Warning, spoilers ahead. If you haven't read the book and you watched my first two lectures, um, I'd like you to read the book before you watch this presentation. Um, here we have... Um, uh, a different book cover with the red rhododendrons on the front um, and Rebecca's name like the gate of a garden so um, again the flowers representing um, female sexuality but the themes here are kind of intricate so let's get started so spoilers don't watch this until you've finished it we're going to talk about twists and turns I want you to discover it the first time don't do it so this book has been said to be kind of a retelling of a fairy tale and in its structure at first it seems like cinderella we have a younger woman of a lower station she meets a handsome wealthy older man he sweeps her off her feet and marries her taking her to his palatial estate a mansion so vast and grand that people take tours there he seems almost like a prince she never has to work again and she spends her days among britain's elite planning parties and sketching and wandering the grounds of her new home. But what kind of a fairy tale is this? Because we also have the story of Bluebeard, in which a wealthy, powerful nobleman who has been previously married chooses a young girl to be his bride. He sweeps her away to his luxurious palace in the countryside. But then he becomes stern and cruel. He gives her the keys to the house, but forbids her to open one of the rooms. And you can kind of see some of the parallels here, right? Um, with Cinderella, um, she's a lady's companion. Um, she doesn't have many prospects in life. Maxim is dark and brooding and dashing, and he takes her away. But she also really doesn't like this life of leisure. It's like not enough for her to do. And then he kind of becomes stern and in some ways cruel. He doesn't want her going into Rebecca's cottage and he's worried about what she might find there and for good reason um, because that is where the, um, the incident, I'll call it for right now, took place. That's where he murdered Rebecca. So in Bluebeard, um, Bluebeard's wife opens the door to the forbidden room and she's flooded with blood and the murdered corpses of his previous wives in one version she's able to flee and get away from her husband um, and he's killed by members of her family um, sometimes her brothers and sometimes her sister in another version um, he murders her after she opens the door and we assume that the cycle begins again and where with this book you know after we find out um, what actually happened in the cottage in this forbidden room of the estate um, we don't you know it's hard to say we're going to talk about the ending more later but it's really difficult because she is kind of able to flee the memory of Rebecca in some ways. In other ways, it's almost like Rebecca's one. Um, so the mad woman in the sea. <laughs> um, the the mad woman in the attic is uh, what we looked at with Jane Eyre. And here we have the mad woman in the sea and the death of female empowerment. Um, I like this quote. Strong women scare weak men. Um, they wouldn't scare strong men, but they do. And so we have to really ask ourselves, is Maxim uh, a strong character or a weak one? Um, and we'll look at what a critic has to say about that in a moment. But really, Rebecca died because of her sexual prowess, because she was having these adulterous affairs, but also because she was a strong woman and, um, and a cruel one. Um, and, and here, cruelty and strength very often go together and kindness and femininity, but also weakness are tied together. So if you haven't read it yet, that's something to look for. As in Jane Eyre, our Rochester here, Maxim de Winter, only discovers the truth about his wife after it's too late. So at first he's beguiled by her charms and her beauty, um, her, her wealthy station. And then once he finds out who she really is, he punishes her for it. The movie version changes this so that um, she trips and falls. He knows that they've been arguing. He doesn't want to be suspected, and so he covers it up. But in the book, 
it's quite a bit more um, direct because he shoots her <laughs> and he's directly involved with her murder. Though the narrator seems to think that Rebecca drove him to it. She had cancer. She wanted to die anyway. And she mocked her husband knowing that he was on the edge. But um, is that really an excuse? You know, her mocking him as if she's still to blame for the fact that he murdered her. There were also um, some indications in terms of her, her sexuality and her running around that she not she was going after um, the very gentlemanly Frank um, Crawley who denied her advances. The boisterous Giles, Beatrice's husband, um, and her cousin Jack as well. Um, Jack who believed that they were going to be married. And then also scores of other men, but possibly also women. And it's never directly stated outright. But we talked before about the author's sexuality and there have been many critics who see mrs danvers as possibly being a lesbian who was obsessed with rebecca possibly that rebecca um you know when she he sees the whole awful truth of her that that means too that she had been with women and not just men i think there may be more shades of this actually in the movie than there are in the book, surprisingly enough, given the, the date of its publication. But it wouldn't have been stated outright um, in either case. So it, it's one of the things we're going to talk about in our discussion boards. If you have seen that or if you're not in my class, you can put it in the comments below. If you read it that way, I'd be interested to know. I think it can be read one way or the other in terms of interpretation. But even though she was cruel, she was a very strong and powerful woman. In contrast, our shy, retiring, very humble narrator um, who fears even admitting to a servant that she's broken that small Cupid figurine that we talked about last time. So there's a direct comparison. And really, in contrast, in Jane Eyre, we talked a lot about how Jane... Jane's strength comes from the fact that she has a strong spirituality, that she is religious, that she is um, kind, and that is where she finds her strength. Here, that's not the case. Kindness and weakness um, is, is, as I said before, is paired up. So think about whether Rebecca is p punished for having this masculine strength. Is our narrator rewarded for her feminine weakness or... Um, do we see in this book the need for something in the middle? And perhaps the author is having, uh, giving us a message here that um, brute masculine strength is too much, feminine retiring weakness is too much. Um, possibly there's a need for a woman who is something different. Here is our excerpt. Um, this is Mrs. Danvers talking. So um, she's remembering Rebecca no one got the better of her. Never, never. She did what she liked. She lived as she liked. She had the strength of a little lion, too. I remember her at 16 getting up on one of her father's horses, a big brute of an animal, too, that the groom said was too hot for her to ride. She struck him all right. I can see her now, her hair flying out behind her, slashing at him, drawing blood, digging spurs into his side, and when she got off his back, he was trembling all over, full of froth and blood. That's how she went at life when she grew up. I saw her. I was with her. She cared for nothing and no one, and then she was beaten in the end. But it wasn't a man. It wasn't a woman. The sea got her. The sea was too strong for her. The sea got her in the end. Oh, I'm getting chills. I love this passage. And um, it wasn't a man. It wasn't a woman. It was the sea. That this this image even that Danny, Mrs. Danvers, has in her head of Rebecca. Now, what's interesting is that the narrator doesn't see at the time uh, until later when she reinterprets this, but she doesn't see the cruelty of Rebecca here, of striking a horse until he's foaming at the mouth and bleeding, um, of being like a lion, right? Of um, not, and this line, she cared for nothing and no one that she really did not care about anyone or anything but herself. And then she was beaten in the end. And that this sentence too, it wasn't a man, it wasn't a woman, 
Um, again, possibly alluding to the fact that Rebecca may have been bisexual and having affairs with both men and women. But what's also interesting is that not only does the narrator have a different view of Rebecca in her head of fantasy, but Danny, um, Mrs. Danvers, also has a fantasy of Rebecca in her head. That the sea got her, that's the only thing that could have taken this beautiful creature down. Um, that... Uh, later when they say that Rebecca was sick and had cancer, she doesn't believe it. Um, Rebecca never told her. In fact, she lied to her that day about where she was going and her and what she was doing during those appointments and that she probably had known about these things for quite some time. So um, it's interesting that the idea here, and we saw some of the read-alikes last time that have the same theme, the idea of how well can you know um, somebody that you're married to. How well can you know somebody that you helped raise even? How well do parents know their children? In this case, they're almost like best friends, sort of, even though Mrs. Danvers worked for her. Um, how well can you really know your best friend? Um, does everyone sort of have one of these secrets? And also, you know, that it wasn't the sea that got her. Maxim shot her and then threw her into the sea. And then the sea threw her right back. And, um, and he had to reckon with that, um, the finding of her body. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, the idea that the sea was too strong and powerful. And in the end, it is, but not in the way that she suspects. So that brings us to fantasy and reality. Um, I just love this picture of this movie star in her beautiful um, gown. The the near and I kind of put this like I had the picture of Vivian Lee before. Um, it's not Rebecca. It's not from the movie Rebecca. I just think it's a it's from 1937 and it shows you the fashions at the time. The, the Rebecca of the narrator's imagination, this beautiful, elegant angel who knew just the right thing to do in every social situation. She was strong, and yet she was this perfect specimen of femininity, graceful and kind. Everyone loved her. Then, um, this is a woman who, um, this protester touched her horse, and she whipped him with her riding crop um, 17 times. Um, the Rebecca of Maxim's memory, a devil who whipped her horses. She mocked servants. She threatened a mentally disabled man. We haven't talked about Ben, but... Um, she threatened him clearly to go to the asylum. The narrator interprets Ben as just being um, slow and not knowing what he's talking about. So he saw Rebecca with her various um, lovers in her cottage, and she threatened him that if he ever told, she sent him to the asylum, right? So that's the Rebecca of Maxim's memory. And yet, um, he seems still, you know, the, 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 I'll go back for a second. The scene where he rubs the azalea on his new wife's neck, he seems still to, to have this con conflicting idea about his first wife, that um, she was sexually beguiling and she did manipulate him and he was in some ways intrigued by that. But she was also having numerous affairs, embarrassing him, um, mocking to him to the point where, according to our narrator, he is forced to murder her. And we're so caught up in this fantasy that the narrator has created. I don't know how you guys read it. And I, again, it's one of our discussion questions, or you can put it below. But some people read this book and they're like, oh, I hope that he he is found innocent of the murder. And other people read because they're so tied to the, what the narrator is saying. She's quite unreliable, right? Um, but other people read it and they're like horrified. Um, how come she never, She all she is is like relieved that he didn't love Rebecca and that he loves her. That's it. She doesn't care that he's a murdering monster. Um so that is how deep into this fantasy she really is. We also have the maxim of the narrator's imagination. He was a kind and perfect prince. Later, she sees him as a man who just regrets marrying her because she's a child. She's not good enough for him. Um, in the narrator's mind, everything she did was negatively compared to Rebecca. And that really began at the seaside in Monte Carlo. He suddenly becomes kind of angry as if he's going to throw her off a cliff. Um, and... 
which shows too that he is a violent person and that already he's taking her to this spot where Rebecca told him how she actually was. She told him all about, you know, her true nature and self and then mocked him and laughed at him. And he's taking her back to all of these places, like to try to redo it in a weird way. Um, a book with Rebecca's signature proves that they were in love. Um, the costume Rebecca once wore pains him because he cherishes her memory really it's just sort of shocking to him that she looks so much like his first wife and of course there we get the reality that um you know this very shy innocent girl will someday grow up and then what will he have to deal with um oh i like this from whisper my husband can't stand my anxiety i can tell he doesn't love me anymore i'm scared i love him so much that's really the kind of reality that our narrator is living with every day and it's easy to to say that she's silly and um but um dating a man who has been married before and being married to him uh a lot of people have to contend with the memory of the first spouse and the fact that sometimes their spouse will be in grief um, and it doesn't really have anything to do with how wonderful they are. Um, and here, living with mental illness, having anxiety, um, our narrator is sympathetic, I think, um, in some ways. And in other ways, she annoyed me. <laughs> and maybe you read her that way too. But you can see that she really is trying and certainly she doesn't know um you know her husband's secrets um she jumped into this thinking it would give her a better life and that they were in love and that it was going to be a fairy tale and then it twisted around the reality is that he hated rebecca and he chose for his second wife someone completely opposite as i said before she really is nearly sexless she does mention that they became lovers at one point um, but not going into detail, not wanting the satyr statue, the rhododendrons and azaleas kind of set her off a little bit. Um, and she oh, she also says that she wishes she could be like a mother to her husband, um, which is an odd kind of thing to say. But Maxim isn't really so much haunted by the memory as he is the fear that the murder will be found out. And yet, she's so wholly consumed by him that she does feels relief, as I said. She's just glad, oh, he loved me the whole time. And she just ignores the fact that he's a murderer. But, um, you know, that's in the 1930s. She doesn't have many prospects. She does have um, a little bit of wealth and, and now, and she does love him. And also, there are people even now who stay with um people who are violent and abusive so you can kind of understand a little bit her situation other dualities so um i love this is a, a depiction of dr jekyll and mr hyde um duality and doppelganger and things being paired we talked about with jane Eyre. that's a trope one of the features of gothic literature Maxim we've talked about is hot and cold by turns holding secrets about his first wife on one hand he's a prince on the other side he's a murderer Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde Frank Frank Crawley is gentlemanly and polite but he did it seems help to cover up this murder and he may be in love with the narrator he spurned Rebecca's attentions um I wish we had a little bit more time here to talk about Frank but at certain points he says things to her like she catches her looking she catches him looking at her and she interprets it as him thinking she's not as good as Rebecca um but I think as a reader we can interpret it as the fact that Rebecca was trying to sleep with him um the narrator is not but they have conversations in terms of social class in terms of age they're much closer together and he says this thing about kindness and how being Rebecca was the most beautiful creature, not woman, but creature, right? Not even fully human because of her appetites. Rebecca was the most beautiful creature he ever saw. But he also says that he thinks that Maxim would rather have a woman who is kind and that kindness can make some, someone beautiful. And he's referring there to the narrator. So he has this dual nature of appearing to be very buttoned up, but possibly having these passions um, underneath. Colonel Julian, 
who appears to be an impartial investigator but also helps cover up the murder and really that's just to keep the social order intact why have a scandal when he thinks that maxim is a, a good upstanding man giles beatrice's husband um, maxim's brother-in-law he seems just jolly and fun and and kind but he had an affair with rebecca and really almost in front of her husband that um maxim saw them go away and saw them come back and um and knew what had happened and Beatrice did as well. There are so many dual personalities and secrets of everyone involved that the narrator almost at one point enjoys speaking to Mrs. Danvers, who she says is honest, um, even though she's criticizing and blaming and, and putting her down. At least she knows how Mrs. Danvers feels about her, right? There's people even like Alice, one of the other maids, who thinks it's below her to... Um, be a servant to somebody who wasn't um, from the upper class so there the servants are even talking about her and have that dual nature as well and um, Mrs. Danvers at least you know you get what you pay for <laughs> you're, you're seeing exactly who she is so one of our other themes is women defined by their social class the novel was written after the first wave of feminism and women had gained the right to vote but before World War II um, when men were fighting in the war and women had to take on some careers to sort of sustain the country, both in the United States and in Great Britain, um, during the war effort, that is a little bit um, in between the first and second wave. We're sort of at this precipice in the 1930s where um, women have the right to vote, but they still have limited opportunities. And because of that, many of them are defined by their social class. And I want you to think about as I'm talking, what choices does our narrator have? What type of woman could she be as she's trying to form her identity? First, we have Mrs. Van Hopper, wealthy, stuffy, fussy, neurotic. She's been married and she has money. She doesn't do anything. She just spends every day complaining and malingering and pretending that she's sick or being slightly sick. She's got a cold and she hires the nurse for like three weeks, right? That's how the narrator and Maxim are able to um, to uh, possibly fall in love, but at least to, to court and date each other. Um, she's not as much defined by her late husband, but she isn't admired or independent. She has money, but she's still dependent on servants, on doctors, nurses, and she has to hire a companion for company. She has no friends really in the world. Mrs. Danvers is a working woman who has authority. She's a servant, but she doesn't really act like one. With Rebecca and Rebecca's relatives, she's called Danny. She's treated much more like a friend or possibly like a beloved aunt than a servant. But she is defined by her relationship to Rebecca just as much as um, the narrator is. And in many ways, she's also defined by her gender and social class. So Frank Crawley manages the estate, not Mrs. Danvers, though she seems like she would be quite capable. Um, she's not really entrusted with um, all of the money, with the tourists, with the balls and things like that. She's just the head housekeeper. And even though she was a servant to Rebecca since birth, and really dependent on her. Now she's dependent on Maxim and his new usurping wife for financial support. She hates the new Mrs. De Winter, and possibly not just because she's not Rebecca, but because they're of similar social rank. Um, and serving the new Mrs. De Winter really would be below Mrs. Danvers. Um, you can think of in Jane Eyre, um, Mrs. Fairfax, right, the housekeeper, how she and Jane were friends um, because they really were of sort of that weird position of not being quite middle class, but not being in that working class spot either and being friendly with Mr. Rochester, but not really one of his crowd. And when um, Jane and Rochester decide to marry, Mrs. Fairfax um, is slightly shocked by that um, even before the other revelations right so we have kind of that same social dynamic here um, this is a picture from the 1930s of a an advertisement for um, a maid's outfit um, and here we have um, the wealthier people who are having um, their breakfast 
So Clarice, um, or Claris, depending on if you want to pronounce it the British way, Claris is the narrator's lady's maid. She is really the one person who makes the narrator feel strong and confident um, when she's getting ready for the costume ball, or at least comfortable. And she represents the kind of innocent working girl the narrator could have remained but again, her age, her gender, her station in life kind of limit her. So Clar Claris is looking up to our narrator and our narrator is seeing her her former self reflected in this younger girl. Um, be it and, and they even say, I think they talked to her parents at one point, right, who say like, oh, Claris says it's more like having a friend than than having a, a an employer. And you could kind of see, too, that if this relationship were to continue, um, which obviously because of the burning of Manderley, it, it probably would not. But if it were to continue, would Claris become more like Mrs. Danvers, where she is taken in as a friend um, and then, um, you know, grows a little bit in her station? And then we have Beatrice. Beatrice is, to me, a very interesting character. As Maxim's sister, she seems to have inherited a little bit of money of her own. Um, but possibly not. It might be her husband's money. At any rate, she hasn't inherited land or Manderley. Um, so, you know, de being defined by her, her brother and her husband in that way. She's confident, it seems at least, and she's talkative. She tries to introduce the narrator to society, make her feel comfortable, but the narrator can never fully be like Beatrice either because Beatrice grew up in this way. And however, even so, while Beatrice seems to be free from the pressures that Maxim feels, um, being the owner of this estate and, and really the one with the more, more money, um, this really might not be the case because Rebecca, we know, had an affair with Giles. And while Beatrice hated Rebecca, and it seems like she probably knew about the affair. She didn't, she didn't do anything about it. Um, again, this idea of preserving the social order and saving face being more important than telling the truth. Um, and because if she had said something, then she's putting her brother in a position where he would be um, have this big scandal in society as well as herself, they would have to go through, um, you know, the British tabloids, even at that time, um, talking about them and things like that. And, and possibly if there were a divorce, um, the splitting up of money and property and everything of that nature. So, um, yeah, so she's sort of trapped as well. And then, oh, I don't know if you guys can see this. I'll zoom in. The more you act like a lady, the more he'll act like a gentleman. Um, there's a news story about this quote in a middle school that was put up and then uh, quickly taken down. Um, but this is sort of the idea of this book. If you act like a lady, he'll be a gentleman. And if you don't, um, he has the right to murder you. Maybe <laughs> I don't know if that's quite the message, but that's what's um, implied in some way. So, yeah, what other choices does our narrator have? Um, like Rebecca, she's almost wholly defined by her social station um, and at first, and then her relationship to Maxim and her new social station. We really don't know anything about her past before Monte Carlo. We have maybe one or two lines about how her parents died when she was younger. We don't really know that much about her future. Um, so there's a lot left out on purpose in terms of characterization. At various times, she says she wants to be a mother to her husband. And it really shows that she still feels like a child and wants to be an adult, but not really a sexual adult who you know, has sex to then have a baby. She wants to be a mother to her husband. Um, she wants to take care of him and be in a, almost a position of power, a loving position, but not, you know, it's a very, it's a very strange and interesting um, way that she thinks about it. Oh, I wish I could be a mother to Maxim. Why? Why? That's kind of weird. By the end of the book, she's come to a place of maturity. Again, that idea of the Bildungsroman, but she loses her innocence 
However, unlike most Bildungsroman, she doesn't have an identity other than the wife of a murderer um, and the lady of the estate of Manderley. Unlike Jane Eyre, we don't get the happy ending. We see that the pair is safe. At first that they felt Rebecca was defeated. Um, I like this quote too. Misogyny is the death of the heart. That, that hatred of women um, being the death of someone's heart. And that is kind of what's going on here. They're living an empty, hollow existence. We don't, we get a little bit of that in the flash forward um, that or in the first chapter, right? Then the book just ends with the burning of Manderley. So you kind of almost have to reread chapter one to bookend what, what has actually happened. They've lost a lot. They can only dream of the home they used to inhabit. And that is all we see. It's all we see. Where will they go? What will they do now that their lives have been ripped apart? There was a scandal. There was a murder. The the, the investigation. The cover up. The arson. Um, and now they're they're together, but um, not happy. It doesn't seem. And is she safe? I think that's a question that you can kind of let hang there. So Rebecca as femme fatale. I wanted to end with this quote from um, a critic. This is Laura Burns, class, gender, and violence bringing unreliable femme fatales. That's a fatal female. Um, from page to screen in Rebecca and Gone Girl. So a lot of comparisons, and that was one of the read-alikes, a lot of comparisons before these two, between these two books. As Whisker relates, the connection between sexuality and violence and unpunishing characters... I'm going to circle that Hang on a moment punishing characters that are overly attractive is a common trope of gothic and horror fiction as a reinforcement of the dichotomous relationship between what is desired and what is feared so um the idea that you're fearing something um, but you're also desiring it at the same time and you're trying to control it this duality is drawn directly from reality, which disillusionment often leads to violence in men who believe that femininity equates to weakness, which masculinity must exert power and authority over. And that's definitely what we see in this book. Maxim is alternately attracted and repelled by the cold, calculating beauty of his first wife, Rebecca, and is frustrated that his ideal choice of partner turns out to be ungovernable and volatile. His frustration and disillusionment reach the breaking point in their final argument when he is finally able to overpower her through her murder. While he saves her from a life of poverty and a life without love, Maxim may prove to be a threat to the second Mrs. De Winter if she ever becomes too strong-willed and opinionated and reminds him of his first wife. So again, she is kind of trapped. And what's also interesting is that he was attracted to Rebecca. Is he attracted to his second wife? I don't think so. I think that he has chosen someone who is a child, who's nearly sexless, not just because of her age, but because of her personality and her anxiety. I think that he saw her as being quite innocent and the opposite of Rebecca. That does not really mean the same thing as loving her or finding her attractive. And so he's he's kind of had this pendulum swing from one end to the other. And here's the other thing. Eventually, our narrator, she might not wear black satin and pearls, but she will be 36. And what then? If she, because of this, has resentment against her husband, grows a backbone, um, sees that Frank Crawley is in love with her, <laughs> which I think is the case, Um then what's going to happen if she has an actual thought or opinion away from her husband? As it is, it seems like they're living this kind of cold, hollow existence together. Um, but um, that is, I think, the core of the book, that this duality of women, um, the the virgin Madonna kind of figure and the, the whore kind of figure on the other end, the angel and the demon, as we saw in Jane Eyre, that this duality is, um, there's a push and a pull to it, that he wants 
um, this perfect virgin, but he's not attracted to her. He doesn't really love her. That he was attracted to this wild, um, self-confident, strong-willed, but also very cold and unkind um, sexual being of Rebecca. Um, but then he couldn't really handle that and um, and had to overpower her. The only way he could do that was through her murder. So um, it's interesting because the author herself said that this was quite a dour book with not a happy ending. And she didn't think that people would buy it or read it. And it turned out to be one of her most best-selling books. Really, I think her most best-selling book. And even 80 years later... Um, people are still reading it and talking about it. So I hope that you enjoyed it and I can't wait to see your comments and to see what you think of these themes and how you interpreted some of the um, points of the novel. So I can't wait. I look forward to that. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.